I mean, science looks and considers evidence. It's got nothing to do with ideology. I mean, when, when you make recommendations for the public, they have to be based on real evidence, on information, not on a lack of information. Now, um, yeah, among the other studies ignored by the dietary guidelines are those that link lower salt intakes to low birth weights in children, to cognitive impairment in children. Why were these studies never considered in the dietary guidelines? Uh, also ignored were peer-reviewed studies that demonstrated that the rates of falls and fractures, I think that's another one here, the rates of falls and fractures among the elderly increased dramatically when they're placed on low-salt diets. And that is why, I mean, it is a standard practice in all assisted living facilities in this country. The first thing that you do is you place the people who come into your <laughs> facility on a low-salt diet. And that is why in assisted living facilities, the rates of falls and hip fractures, fractures of all types, are about three times as great as in the normal home environment. There's a multiplicity of concerns and risks that have recently been described uh, in the peer-reviewed medical literature. Um, and uh, they, they will be, you'll, there, there will be links to them if you go to the website presentation. There's another a whole series of papers that have recently been published associating negative consequences with reduced salt in the diet. To what extent have they been taken into account in the dietary guidelines? None as far as we have seen. Amongst the most egregious sins of omission is the refusal of the dietary guidelines to seriously consider the, la the latest evidence linking low salt diets to increased mortality uh, and readmissions for heart failure patients one of the most recent and one of the most well-controlled studies in the world on the subject was totally ignored. And if you actually go back to the transcripts of the deliberation of the dietary guidelines, when one member of the dietary guidelines brought up this study, the person who was in charge of the SALT subcommittee on the dietary guidelines, the first response was, well, of course, you have to understand that this was carried out in Italy. Rather than dealing with evidence, they, that's what ideology does. I, rather than deal with the science and rather than deal with the evidence, one does whatever you can to belittle anything that's counter to your, your, to your agenda. Even if the, the agenda is well-meaning, by the way. It's got nothing to do with science. Uh, further reducing salt in our diet will have a negative effect on dietary choices. While the dietary guidelines recommend increasing salad and dark green vegetable consumption the, because the, the, these items provide bitter, uh, healthy but very bitter phytochemicals, and broccoli is a perfect example, reducing the salt intake uh, makes these foods less appealing and will adversely affect their intake. Children will not eat broccoli, as an example, without salt. It's the salt that makes these food items more palatable. If not, they taste like grass. The dietary guidelines praise the Mediterranean eating pattern which has been responsible for the excellent health statistics in that part of the world. While the dietary, what the dietary guidelines do not state, however, is that the level of consumption in the Mediterranean diet um, uh, of salt has, has, is about 40% higher than it is in the U.S. diet. There's, and as a matter of fact, if you, if you think of the Italian diet with the olives and the anchovies and the parmesan and the prosciutto and the salamis and so on and so on and so forth, you can very, very clearly see it. It's an extremely high salt diet. But the Italians have health metrics that are better than ours. Um, let's see, where are we over here? Um, there is considerable peer-reviewed clinical uh, research that predicts several negative consequences for a population-wide uh, reduction in salt across all age groups. That is why the Salt Institute, and only the Salt Institute, has been the only organization who has repeatedly asked the Secretary of Health and Human Services to support a large clinical trial that would show the health outcomes resulting from population-wide salt reduction. And for us, it would be a crapshoot. We, there were no preconditions to this request to the Secretary of Health. The request has always been made, uh, as I said, without preconditions, and it has always been refused. We are now eating less salt than we ever had in history. And if anybody uh, doubts that, uh, I, I urge them to find me figures anywhere. 
showing that at one point in history we were eating less salt than we are now. Uh, in fact, the data does not exist. The only place I was able to find data was going back into military rations for soldiers and prisoners of war for the last 200 years. And they have been remarkably consistent going back to the War of 1812 up until the end of the Second World War, Italian prisoners of war, uh, as an example, fed in, uh, in camps in the, uh, where they were housed in South Africa. They have all been somewhere between 18 and 20 grams of salt per day. That's more than double what we consume now. Um, now, people will say, well, yeah, but in the past we had a lower life expectancy. You have to understand what life expectancy is. Life expectancy is normally calculated if you're given a single figure based on your life expectancy at birth. And the biggest change that we have had uh, is uh, the reduction in infant mortality. A hundred years ago, if you take a look at the U.S. Census figures, let's say 1850, uh, if when you were born you had a, a uh, life expectancy of uh, 35 years. If you managed to reach the age of 10, you had another 40 years to go. So the, it, there was this jump just by getting past infancy. This amazing jump, all of a sudden you're, now, you're no longer living 35 years, you're living close to 60 years, and so on and so forth. So from that time to this time, the difference has been all the, 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 the new advances in medicine. So certainly we can't really say that from a dietary point of view that the diet in the past contributed to low life expectancies. Anyway, up until the end of the Second World War, salt was the primary means of food preservation. And beginning in the 1950s, refrigeration took over that function and our salt consumption dropped dramatically in that period of 1950 to 1960. And from the 1960s onward, according to the Willett paper, it has remained flat. So we're eating less salt than we ever have. But the dietary guidelines are recommending a level of salt far lower than can be found in any other country in the world, and the data is, is very clear on that, and lower than in any period in recorded history. If actually implemented, this will effectively place the entire population of the U.S. into a massive clinical trial, without the consumer's knowledge and certainly without their consent. Now, it, it's rather interesting because uh, we've been very fortunate uh, the last number of iterations of the dietary guidelines really haven't worked. They haven't really been successful. But now the, um, there are forces at play. Uh, for instance, Walmart has been influenced to go ahead and insist that all its suppliers, that their food products uh, attain a level of sodium, as an example, uh, that is recommended by the dietary guidelines. I mean, if Walmart does it, it means that all the food manufacturers will do it. They're not going to just make a formulation for Walmart. So that effectively will reduce the level of salt in our diet below a level than we've ever had in recorded history by quite a bit. Every nutritional trial in this country, every clinical trial in this country is, is accompanied by a, an informed consent on the part of the people who are taking part in the trial. They are told what the possible positive and negative impacts are of this trial. That is not the case over here. The dietary guidelines are being promoted and pushed ahead without ever asking anybody for their informed consent. And indeed, there are some major concerns of negative consequences because the Institute of Medicine in their report, Strategies to Reduce Sodium Intake, which was made to coincide with the 2010 Dietary Guidelines, it was just issued last year, basically say, as the levels of sodium in the diet drop, we will be monitoring for any unintended consequences. Now, there is nowhere a, a more clear statement that we're going into a trial than that. We'll be monitoring for unintended consequences. Well, they've never asked anybody permission to go into this trial. Public Law 101, Section 301 of the Dietary Guidelines clearly states that the information and guidelines contained in each report required under, under the, the, right, the correct paragraph shall be based on the preponderance of scientific and medical knowledge which is current at the time the report is prepared. With reference to the current knowledge or the state uh, of uh, the relationship of salt to health, uh, I believe that the uh, 2010 dietary guidelines do not achieve this objective as laid out in the public law. 
In fact, the Salt Institute believes that the 2010 dietary guidelines are confused, they're simplistic, and they're far more a product of ideology, as I said, than science. Following them may very well do more harm than good to the nation's health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morton. Um, a, an additional concern for us is the use of salt substitutes that trick the body into thinking it is eating salt. And these, what these, the effects of these substitutes are no, is anybody's guess, but that's what will be used in these low, low salt foods.